Welcome to Training Module 449, Dynamic Balancing. Over the next few hours, you will learn what dynamic unbalance is, how to locate it, and how to correct it. During this first segment of our course, we will explain the characteristics and causes of unbalance in rotating equipment and the effect. Once you understand these basic principles, we will show you how to perform the calculations required in dynamic balancing. First of all, what do we mean by unbalance? Unbalance is the unequal distribution of weight in a rotating part. This graphic illustration shows that one side of the flywheel is heavier than the opposite side, resulting in an unequal distribution of weight around the center of the wheel. The reasons for unbalance are many. Blow holes, like that shown here, are actually air pockets that formed in the wheel when it was being cast in the factory. This, in effect, creates a light spot, making this side of the wheel lighter than the opposite side. Sometimes the webbing of a wheel varies from one side to the other. The webbing shown on the top side of the wheel is thicker than the bottom. This means that the top side of the wheel will be heavier, throwing the wheel off balance. Errors in machining of a rotating part can cause difficulty. For instance, a machinist may remove too much metal from one side of a part that is not true. This will leave one side heavier than the other. Another problem which may occur is that the center hole is bored off-center. This illustration is an extreme example of what we mean. As you can see, the result would be obvious. Eccentricity will also cause unbalance. The unbalance results from the fact that the rotating part is not perfectly round, or concentric. This means that the part is eccentric, or not round. On occasion, a part will wear on one side, or erosion will cause an unbalanced condition. However, the primary reason for unbalance is a combination of tolerances between parts that results in the rotating part wobbling as it spins. In short, it does not revolve around its center as it should. All of these reasons for unbalance have the same result, an unequal distribution of weight around the center. The end result of imperfections is known as a heavy spot. The heavy spot, as shown graphically here, makes one side of the rotating assembly heavier than the other side, creating the unbalance. Here's something to keep in mind. Be very careful not to assume that there is always one heavy spot, as you see here. The heavy spot is most often a combination of imperfections which work together to create an unseen heavy spot at a designated point. To cope with the problem, you must first locate this so-called heavy spot and find out its weight. We will show you exactly how this is done later in the training module. Once you find the spot, you must be able to measure its effect. A very common method is ounce-inches. Here's what we mean. Let's assume that the heavy spot shown in this rotating assembly weighs two ounces and that its position is three inches from the center of the flywheel. To measure the amount of unbalance, we simply multiply the weight times the number of inches. In short, two ounces times three inches equals six ounce inches. This is a very common method of determining the amount of unbalance in a rotating assembly, such as a flywheel. To correct this unbalance, it would be necessary to remove an equivalent amount of weight somewhere on the heavy side, or to add a counterweight opposite the heavy spot. We mentioned that the heavy spot weighs two ounces and was three inches from the center. To balance it, we would install a counterweight of two ounces, three inches from the center, 
diametrically opposed to the heavy spot. This would balance the flywheel. However, it may not always be possible to install a counterweight on the exact same radius as the heavy spot. This is why the heavy spot is measured in ounce inches. It allows you to select various weights and radii for the counterweight, as long as they equal the heavy spot, which weighs six ounce inches. We can install a six ounce weight one inch from the center, a two ounce weight three inches from the center, a three ounce weight two inches from the center or even a one-ounce weight six inches from the center. By looking closely, you'll see that the weight of each counterweight multiplied times the radius in inches gives the same result in each case, six-ounce inches. Therefore, any of these adjustments would serve to counterbalance the two-ounce heavy spot three inches from the center of the flywheel. On the other hand, the unbalance may also be corrected by using the same basic ounce-inch formula, but this time using it to determine the amount of weight to be removed on the same radial line as the heavy spot. We could remove six ounces at one-inch radius or remove one ounce at six inches. You'll learn through experience how to make the decision on whether to add a counterweight or to remove material to balance the rotating element. You may also find that your plant measures the unbalance in their rotating equipment with gram inches instead of ounce inches. Your instructor will tell you more about your procedures in this area. The method would be identical, the only difference being that you would use grams instead of ounces. Now that you understand what we mean by unbalance, let's be more specific. There are two basic types of unbalance which you will encounter in your work. They are static and dynamic. Webster defines static as meaning not active, while dynamic means active. Therefore, you will be working with unbalance in parts which are active, and those which are not active. Let's assume that we have installed this flywheel in a carrier for the purpose of checking for unbalance. The wheel is not moving, or not active. Therefore, we will static balance it. This is done by simply allowing the wheel to rotate freely until it stops. When it does, the heavy spot will normally be down, as shown here. To balance the wheel, you simply must add a counterbalance opposite the heavy spot or remove material on the same radial line as the heavy spot. Remember, it is very important that a counterweight be the correct ounce inches or gram inches to balance the heavy spot you will know that the wheel is correctly balanced when it will always hold its position, no matter how you turn it in the carrier. This means that the weight is equally distributed around the center, and that the center of gravity is exactly in the center of the flywheel. That's basically how static balancing is completed, although there are other refinements you'll learn through experience. Now that you know what is meant by static balancing, let's turn to the subject of this training module, dynamic balancing. As we mentioned a few moments ago, dynamic unbalance is unbalance in an active or rotating object. Let's use the same flywheel for dynamic balancing that we used for static balancing. We will assume that the flywheel is mounted in the same carrier, However, it is now coupled to a driver that is turning the wheel at its normal operating speed. This means that the wheel is active or dynamic. You will also assume that the wheel has a heavy spot, as we showed you earlier during static balancing. 
However, the effect of that heavy spot is now different. The rotation of the flywheel creates centrifugal force, which amplifies the vibration created by the heavy spot. The result is vibration. The amount of vibration depends on the weight of the heavy spot and its position. Study this illustration carefully. As you can see, there are two heavy spots, each weighing five ounces. The only difference is their distance from the center of the flywheels. The difference means a great deal with regard to unbalance. The five ounce weight, two inches from the center, causes an unbalance of ten ounce inches. The other five ounce weight causes an unbalance of forty ounce inches, since it is eight inches from the center. In short, the farther the heavy spot is from the center, the greater the unbalance it creates. You would be amazed at the amount of force that is generated by even the smallest amount of unbalance. This formula, which is reproduced in your workbook reference section, may be used to determine the amount of force generated by unbalance. For example, if this flywheel were turning at 5,200 RPM and it had only one ounce inch of unbalance, that one ounce inch would generate nearly 48 pounds of force along the line shown. So as you can imagine, even the smallest heavy spot can create tremendous amounts of destructive vibration. You'll soon find that 80% of all vibration problems in rotating equipment are caused by unbalance. Over the past few minutes, we have described the various aspects of dynamic balancing in one plane. In other words, the flywheel we have used for an example shows both the heavy spot and the correction weight in the same plane. This is called single plane balancing. However, you'll soon find that most of your balancing is done in two or more planes. Here's an example of what we mean. This is an electric motor rotor. The rotor shaft is mounted in bearings, as pointed out on the illustration. Let's assume that there are heavy spots on both ends of the rotor, as shown. Needless to say, the heavy spots will not necessarily be in the same location on each end. This means that you have two separate problems of unbalance in the same rotating assembly. To correct each of the unbalanced problems, it will be necessary to add the appropriate correction weights in the same plane as the heavy spot, or as close to it as you can get. So in this particular case, the rotor would have to be balanced in two planes. Here's another type of rotor which you may encounter on the job. This is the rotating assembly from a compressor. As you can see, there are unbalanced problems in several locations. Although it might be possible to correct the problem by correcting the unbalance on each end, it is much more effective to correct the unbalance in the same plane as the unbalance. This is called multi-plane balancing and can only be done on shop balancing equipment. There is also another factor which must be considered in balancing a rotating assembly in more than one plane. It is called cross effect. For instance, let's consider this electric motor rotor which has unbalanced problems in two separate planes. Let's assume that we corrected the unbalanced problem on the left end of the rotor by adding a correction weight. This does not mean that all of the vibration there would be eradicated. Some vibration would still remain due to cross effect from the unbalance on the other end. In other words, the right end may be unbalanced enough to create vibration that will shake the left end. This cross effect should always be considered during balancing in more than one plane. 
If you were unable to remove all of the unbalance from one end of a rotor, it may be because the remaining vibration is actually cross-effect from the other end. This means that you should balance the opposite end, then come back and check the first end. You may find it necessary to go back and forth several times before all of the vibration is gone. Here are three rotors, all with unbalanced problems. Your only problem is to decide whether to balance them in one plane or two planes. This is especially true for the short rotors, like that in the center. Your workbook reference section includes rules of thumb that may be utilized in determining whether to balance a rotating assembly in one or two planes. Your instructor can explain if you have any difficulty understanding them. There is one more factor that must be considered in dynamic balancing. Whether the rotor shaft is rigid or flexible. This is decided by the operating speed of the shaft and rotor. Every assembly has a natural frequency. This is the frequency at which the assembly likes to vibrate. For instance, this shaft has a natural frequency of 2,000 RPM. When the shaft reaches this speed, we have a condition called resonance, and the rotating assembly will vibrate violently. When you listen to a tuning fork vibrate, you are listening to the resonance caused by vibration at its natural frequency. The only problem is that a machine should not operate continuously at its natural frequency. If it does, the vibration at resonance will shake it apart. For this reason, the speed at which the natural frequency occurs is called the critical speed. The operating speed of any rotor with regard to the critical speed determines whether it is flexible or rigid. Rotors which operate below 70% of their critical speed are called rigid. Those which operate above 70% of their critical speed are considered flexible. There are several rules to keep in mind when balancing rotors. These rules are also outlined in your workbook reference section. During the past few minutes, we have scanned the field of dynamic balancing. As you can now see, it requires a great deal of attention to small details that may seem unimportant. Although it would be impossible for you to remember all of the facts and formulas used in balancing, you should understand the basic principles and how they affect dynamic balancing. We have some questions for you now in exercise number one in your workbook.